Hello London, I guess I should say. Um, yes, as, as Songhain said, my name is Nick Radcliffe. Um, I, this is actually my second workshop of the day. I, um, I reprised TDDA, um, which is a library we'll be using actually during this afternoon's session. Um, this morning, I guess at least one or two faces look familiar and we're, we're probably there. There'll be some overlap, but hopefully not too much. Uh, and what we're going to talk about is anomaly detection. Um, I hope I set the level at introductory. It's certainly fairly simple stuff. Though, of course, when I submitted it, I might not have known it was going to be introductory, so it might not have been. Um, I don't know whether people saw uh, the various messages about what you need to be able to follow along. There are various bits of software, and there were a couple of um, minor issues with that. Um, hopefully, you've all got uh, NumPy and Pandas anyway. Um, it's all going to go better if you've got Python 3 than Python 2 to a slightly greater extent than I realized when I wrote this off because it turns out the Feather data format that we'll be using is not compatible between Python 2 and Python 3. Um, but a lot of the stuff will work in Python 2 as well. Um, you'll need the TDDA library. All of these things are available from PyPI with pip install. Uh, obviously, there are source versions available as well. The TDDA library is available on GitHub. Um, you'll need the Feather format, which... Um, again, you can get with PIP. Uh, Feather, who, who here has heard of the Feather format? Yeah, a few hands, not, not all that many. Um, Feather is a, a, a thing developed jointly by Wes McKinney, the, author, the original author of Pandas, and um, uh, the R guy whose name temporarily escapes me, Hadley Wickham, uh, and it's for interoperable data frames between R and Python. Uh, and it's at least supposed to be better than CSVs in the sense it carries some metadata around and preserves precision and stuff like that. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit broken, so you also need uh, the PMMIF format, which is now available from PyPI. I apologize to anyone who tried installing it and found it wasn't available. That was because it turns out we'd never uploaded it to PyPI, um, though it was available in source from GitHub, but it's there now. Uh, and in case the text is small or you want to refer to it later, um, the slides are available in the repo that you can clone that has the data that we'll be using in the ooh, exercises, examples, whatever you want to call the things we'll be doing. Um, the TDA library does have documentation uh, and there's a blog at tda.info. So that's all the introductory crap. Um, <laughs> Yep. So what we're going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit to start with about the whole notion of anomaly detection and try and introduce you to what we're trying to do. I'm sure the general ideas will be familiar to people. Uh, and then we're probably going to try building some anomaly detectors by hand, partly to show that that can be quite unpleasant and nasty. Um, and then we'll show you some slightly easier ways to do it. Um, the intention, I'm sure we've got a spread of expertise here, and what I've tried to do is to um, present kind of variant exercises where if you're super sophisticated, you can do a much more complicated version of it, and if, if not so much, you can just read code or try running things and, and so on. Um, and there was something else I was going to say, but I've, I've forgotten what it was. Oh, yeah, uh, no, so something you mentioned. Um, the, the background for this course is that um, we're developing a course for DataCamp uh, on anomaly detection in Python. Uh, DataCamp is an online learning uh, platform that you can, you can pay to do courses on. Um, this should be released in um, soon-ish. Um, and it's supposed to be a four-hour online course uh, where the emphasis is very much on um, machine marking of exercises and therefore the course is slightly oriented towards typing and programming as opposed to concepts which I think are the really important things. So I'm, I'm going to try and stress the concepts quite a lot because I actually think that's, that's the most important stuff. But in terms of the stuff you'll be, you'll be doing if you play along, um, there'll, 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 there'll be a certain amount of typing and Python and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I guess I, I partly apologize for the fact this is the first time out and the exercises haven't really been tested and it's possible that there will be anomalies in the exercises, but of course that's all just the in-joke. Um, and, uh, uh, but partly you're very privileged to be getting this before anyone else in the whole universe, uh, if it turns out to be any good. Um, well, sure, you're getting it whether it turns out to be good or not. But, um, so anomaly detection. Um, 
Obviously, as the name suggests, and as you know, um, anomaly detection is about trying to find that which is abnormal, that which is um, a deviation from what you expect. And probably the most important thing to understand about it is there are no right answers. Um, you can't tell from a pure data. You, you can say from a statistical perspective this value is awfully big or something like that. But without context, there's no such thing as there's no such thing as obviously wrong data, or even the stuff that is obviously from a statistical perspective wrong isn't necessarily wrong in context if you understand what's going on. And so we're very interested in... Um, and typically, we are using anomaly detection to uh, tackle some kind of problem. Um, common industrial applications... Well, in fact, common applications are things like detecting fraudulent... Uh, credit card transactions or any kind of kind of fraud, really. Um, systems failures, noticing when a server falls over or something goes wrong. Um, bogus e-commerce ratings, people who are trying to game the Amazon ratings or the Netflix ratings or whatever. Um, medical problems, detecting a heart arrhythmia, you can formulate as, uh, as an anomaly detection problem. And indeed, almost anything that you would build an ordinary predictive model for, you can typically reformulate as an, as an anomaly detection problem if you want. So if you talk about credit scoring, you could regard um, people who don't pay you back as anomalous and, and, and then reformulate the credit rating problem as can we find those anomalous people who look like they're, they're, they're not going to pay us back. Uh, so it's, 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 it has very broad applicability. Um, and almost always when people talk about anomaly detection, they think about the negatives. They think about detecting bad things, and that is, that is what we do mostly. Uh, but it's also the case that anomaly detection can be very relevant to finding good things as well as bad things, um, <laughs> if good things can be anomalous. Um, so, you know, examples of that would be things like spotting uh, interesting patterns in customer behavior that you weren't expecting that suggest opportunities. So I'm, I'm sure you've all heard the old saw about uh, beer and nappies at Walmart that they noticed. It's, it's, a, it's a rather nasty sexist story that I don't necessarily want to repeat, but it turned out that putting beer near nappies works quite well um, in, t in terms of generating combined sales. Uh, that was something that supposedly, and it's probably an ur urban myth, was found by, uh, by an automated data analysis process. Um, you know, more generally detecting... I mean, a, lo a lot of what we're going to be talking about with anomaly detection is actually very, very simple methods. We're just looking for, in some cases, things that are out of range or things that are missing or gaps in data and stuff like that. It can be more sophisticated. You can throw the fanciest machine learning system in if you want to, uh, to do various kinds of detection, but it will still have to fit into some kind of a context like this to be useful as an anomaly detection system. We're not going to be talking about the fancy methods at all. And if anyone was here expecting we were going to have, like, four hours, well, actually in a 90 minute session that would be ambitious, but 90 minutes of, uh, you know, how to use deep learning systems for anomaly detection, that's not what you're going to get. Do feel free to free up your seats and let some of the people who haven't got seats leave if, if that's what you were hoping for. We're going to be talking about a lot of very mundane, simple anomaly detection stuff and the frameworks that you need around these things in order to do it. Um, so, yes, you know, other sorts of things, detecting low usage periods when, you know, maybe you don't need the same level of servers or the same amount of staff coverage or, or, or that kind of stuff uh, are absolutely anomaly detection problems as well. I should also say um, people should feel free to shout if I am unclear or speaking nonsense or making obvious mistakes. It's, it's a workshop. It's informal. We can do that. Um, I might not be able to see you because I'm a bit blinded by the light, but if you shout loud enough, I'll, I'll notice. So um, let's just talk a little bit about uh, the kinds of things that we might, we might detect as anomalies. Um, some of the sorts of things that we're looking for are just outlying values of single dimensions or single variables. So, you know, prices that are much too big or um, successive events that are much too close together. If they're supposed to be from a human and you're getting 100,000 a second, that's, that's, you know, not an ordinary kind of a human. Um, Sometimes you have to look at multiple values. So sometimes it's a pair of values that form an anomalous and unlikely um, um, combined value, even though the individual values are both, both perfectly sensible. Um, my mind always turns to alcohol. You know, the two-year-old who's drinking an awful lot of beer or something would be a kind of stupid example of that. Um, 
patterns of regularity or irregularity in data streams. We tend to be very interested in streams of data. You can, you can find anomalies in any kind of data, but it's particularly streaming data that we, we tend to focus on. Um, patterns of regularity can be a signal that something's wrong or that there's a gaming system or that there's, there's something you don't expect. But it can also be exactly what you expect. If there's a backup going on at the same time every morning, then you'll probably see a spike in your, you know, in your volume of traffic when that, when that backup hits. Again, it's all about context. It's all about... Um, understanding what you're looking for. And the job of the detectors is, is, is to... The job of the anomaly detectors in the first instance is just to detect anomalies, however defined. And then there's a separate process of trying to map anomalies in the cases where there are specific things you're hoping to use the anomaly detection to diagnose to map the anomalies onto actual... Uh, bad behavior or good behavior or, or bad outcomes or whatever it is you want, defects or, or actual fraud or whatever, uh, just, just as in machine learning. Um, areas of high or low density in data can be interesting, again, depending on whether they're expected. Um, illegal data values, more generally, you know, nulls where there aren't allowed to be nulls, which, um, or, or, or repeated values or stuff like that. So, so lots, of, lots of simple things. Um, what do they look like? Um, you know, obviously there are there are cases like these where very clearly that spike looks anomalous without knowing anything about the data. It looks odd. And, and from, again, from a sort of pure data perspective, it is anomalous. But whether it's bad, whether it corresponds to anything that shouldn't be there, or it's just telling you that, you know, this is the advert, and a lot of people turn the kettles on when, when the adverts start on, on, you know, in the middle of some popular television series or something. You don't know. You have to, you have to uh, address it in the context of some given circumstance and some interpretation. Um, Probably slightly clearer cut, a hole in the data like this would almost always be wrong if, you know, if, 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 if the volumes are high. But again, not necessarily. And even if it is, there are many different things that could be causing it. You know, maybe this is the transition from British summertime or whatever, and there actually wasn't a 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. Um, in, in, in local time on the morning. The clocks went forward. And so from one perspective, it's anomaly, and it's anomalous, but it's not necessarily indicating anything that's wrong. Right. Again, it always depends on context. Um, all of these diagrams are much less extreme than, than, than they typically would be. In fact, when you see a typical spike like this that actually is an anomaly, what you really see is a completely flat line with a spike because the scale of the thing is, is so enormous that you can't see the rest of the data. And similarly, you know, we've got a spike at both ends of this distribution, but they're not actually very far from the center of the distribution. Again, in reality, it's like you've got all the good values are between you know, two and three and you've got a minus 4 billion over here and a plus 16 trillion over here. Uh, and so, again, if you, you know, if you actually look at it, you'll see almost nothing except the anomalies in the data, uh, or at least the most extreme anomalies in the data. Um, so one of the things that, that often confuses people with anomaly detection is, you know, why do we need to automate this stuff? Can't we just look at graphs? And the answer is, well, partly, yes. If you, if you can spot the stuff on graphs, that's fine. Um, even just plotting it on graphs and seeing it can be very hard because of the extremity of uh, the nature of a lot of the things that you detect as anomalies. Uh, but also, in order to uh, benefit from graphical approaches, you have to have someone looking at the stuff. And so, obviously, a lot of the idea with anomaly detection is to automate it so that there are alert-based systems, trigger-based systems, and you get into all the problems of over-alerting and getting the balance right between really detecting the things that you want and not, not having lots of false positives. But Automating these processes, even if you can spot them graphically, even if you have a representation, is still typically very useful. Um, so, as an example, this is this is some price data. This is uh, real price data that we. It's been very slightly disguised, but essentially real price data that uh, that we took from a client. It's about 15 million records, and if you do the simple histogram showing the prices, it looks like the plot on the left, right? So everything, unaccountably, is between zero and twenty thousand dollars. These are actually airline prices, um, but for some reason the scale goes all the way up to one hundred and sixty or one hundred and eighty thousand or so. And that's because there's an outlier there that's in the wrong currency. In fact, there are a bunch of outliers that push things. You can't see them. You can't see them at all on the graph, but they're there. Um, and in fact, you sort of can't see them. Well, you, you can't see them because they're too low. Because obviously, on the scale of the graph, they're much less than a pixel high. So. Um, there, are, there are many things we can do about that. We can use um, nonlinear bins is one technique. Um, but a very powerful thing to do, 
Well, there's extra lines in that middle graph, huh? but uh, a very powerful thing to do is to use log scales. And uh, I guess everyone will be familiar with the concept of logs. You might not be familiar with actually using log and log log plots. So in, in the middle graph, what we've done is we've taken that same data and we've made the x-axis logarithmic. And as a result, we've got bins that go from, well, technically a tenth of a penny to a pound, a pound to 10 pounds, 10 pounds to 100 pounds, and so on. And you can see that most of the data, plausibly for flights, is between 100 and 1,000 pounds. Um, but you actually, st you actually start to see what's going on. Um, but in terms of the outliers, you can't really see anything outside those three middle bins because although we've log adjusted the X scale, we haven't log adjusted the height, so you can't see any of the small numbers. So on the right-hand graph, we've done a form of log-log plot where we're now plotting the uh, heights of the bars logarithmically as well. And therefore, and I see people nodding. I apologize for all the people for whom this is very obvious. I, I, I can guarantee there are people who haven't seen this sort of thing before. So I hope you'll bear with me. Um, so now, having, having just both of them onto log scales, we can now see that there are about 10 things in this one million pound plus flight. And I don't know about you, but that's more than I typically think Ryan is worth, uh, even if Michael O'Leary disagrees, um, and so forth. So these sorts of very simple transformations are helpful. And even if you are using automated systems, it's still typically very useful to plot things. So knowing about these, these sorts of techniques, which are, which are available in uh, pretty much all the major plotting libraries is useful. Um, here's another example of what I was talking about with pairs of values. So obviously these are concerned with single values or, or single streams of values. Um, here's an example where uh, on the left we've got the vast bulk of the data is lying on this, this line in the middle. But, and again, this is, this is uh, the opposite of exaggerated. It's very compressed compared with what it would probably look like in reality. But we've got a couple of severely off diagonal points where... Um, almost certainly we've got, we, we, we would describe those an, as anomalous and they may or may not be incorrect but they certainly don't fit the pattern or here's another you know, fairly typical thing where we've got one point or some collection of points sitting way out on the, on the right individually those values are not that odd but in combination they're very odd um, and here's what I was talking about regularity and so you know, the question is of course well you know, are the, this, this, is, this is a week's worth of data We've obviously got a spike at a similar time each day, more or less. So, you know, are those, do those just represent backup processes or something or, or a time when everyone gets home from work or whatever? Or is there something wrong? Even if there is something wrong, what about the missing one on, on sort of Friday night, Saturday morning? Um, it certainly looks like there's something odd, but knowing what it is is something you're going to have to dive into in order to, to actually find it. So what we're looking for with anomaly detection is systems that will help us identify these points, uh, these sorts of points, and... Uh, do something with them, alert us to them, or whatever. So, and if you'll forgive me, I'm just going to get some water. So, the general setup that we're looking for um, with an anomaly sector is something that takes, it doesn't have to be a stream, but most of the time it is some kind of a stream of data like this coming into the top. Um, and that fundamentally spits, hopefully, most of it out on the left saying not anomalous. Obviously, we hope that most of our data isn't, isn't anomalous or, or we're in real trouble, but occasionally spits out one or two of them and says, this one's worth looking at. And we're not necessarily looking for them all to represent whatever it is we're trying to detect, but we certainly want to narrow it down as much as possible and, and hopefully have a high proportion of the true bads or the true goods or whatever it is we're looking for on the right. And so then, very much in the same way as in, in an ordinary machine learning, sort of supervised learning context, if we have got something, if we're, if we're doing a medical test, for example, and we're, you know, we're screening for cancer or something, then we, um, in reality, you know, either the patients have cancer or the particular cancer we're looking for or they don't or the disease or whatever it is or the item is defective. Um, the idea is that the ones I've colored in are truly defective and we're doing some kind of anomaly detection that we hope is correlated in a strong way with identifying defective items. And what we hope is that the anomaly detector is going to spit out a lot of the defective ones or all of the defective ones and very few or none of the non-defective ones. So the non-defective ones are going to go left and the defective ones are going to go right. And of course, in the um, standard terminology, um, we call the ones that, uh, that get detected positives and ones that don't get detected as negatives. And so we have the, context, the concepts of true and false positives with the true positives being the ones that we detect as being anomalous that are in fact defective in this case, the false positives being the ones that get detected but aren't in fact 
truly defective. Um, the true negatives as being the ones that aren't defective and don't get flagged by the system, and the false negatives as being the, the ones that actually are defective but that come out the wrong side of the detector. Um, very often, uh, when we build detection systems, we'll actually not just build a binary classifier, but we'll build some kind of a score. We'll have some level of confidence or ranking or something to say how likely something is, and we'll, we'll actually put a cutoff on that score to determine which side, you know, whether to classify something as, as anomalous or not. And what we'd like with our ideal detector, of course, is that, you know, if this is what our population looks like, what we'd really like is that these are all the non-defective ones and these are the defective ones. And so if we set the cutoff anywhere here, then we get 100% true negatives on this side and 100% true positives on this side, i.e. defectives and non-defectives. Um, and that would be ideal. Uh, what in practice, of course, normally happens is, is that it's not like that. Our false positive rate doesn't go from, um, uh, you know, it doesn't step up like that. It steps up like this as, as we adjust the cutoff and sure. Obviously, if we cut off here, then we're saying we're not going to mark anything defective, so we're not going to get any false positives, but we're also not going to get any true positives. If we cut off all the way over here, we're not going to get any, uh, I always get confused, the other way around. We're not going to, we're, we're going to detect everything, and we're going, so we're going to defect detect all of the true positives, but we're also going to, to flag everything else. And so that's no good. And the trick is to try and find a good point in the middle where our system's actually mostly doing the right thing. Um, I wasn't sure about whether to include this, but pe people very often get very, very confused by false positive and false negative rates. And, and because I'm a mathematician, I thought we'd have one slightly mathematical exercise that you don't have to do, but if you want to, you could. Um, so the way these things are normally defined is that the false positive rate is the proportion, and it's, it's easier in the words actually in the form of the proportion of non-defective items that get flagged as anomalous, and the uh, false negative rate is the proportion of <coughs> defective items that get flagged as non-anomalous. Okay, so that's the two misclassifications. And so... Um, if you're keen, and I would encourage you to be keen... Um, it's interesting just to work through and look at a fairly typical example where maybe we have 10,000 items and 1% uh, of them are defective, i.e. 1% of them are, true, uh, are, are truly positive and 99% of them are true negatives. And we have a detector that flags 80% of the defective items as anomalous and 10% of the non-defective items as positive. So if you would like to accept the challenge, fill in the four boxes with the numbers that are going to come through on average in expectation. Confirm that the false positive and the um, false negative rates are 20 and 10%, as it looks like they should be. And then the really interesting bit, the bit that everyone gets wrong, is calculate, given these numbers, and guess first actually would be a really interesting thing, what proportion of the items flagged by the detector are actually true positives? So I'm going to encourage you to do this. You're allowed to use computers. It's fine. You're allowed to use mental arithmetic. There will not be a test. It's just for you. But it's I, I, think it, I think it's just about worth doing. I think you will get something out of it. You might be surprised by the results. In the context of medical tests, people are almost always surprised, including doctors are almost always surprised by the results. So if you replace it with defective, if you replace defective items with cancers or you know, whatever, doctors are almost always completely wrong about what makes you feel like you're back in school doing maths, don't worry, the rest of it's not like this at all. It's, it's code and graphs and Also, if you've got the slides, the answers are on the next slide, but obviously... <laughs> <laughs>
you haven't calculated it yet, really think about what you expect the answer to be for the last bit, because I think that's, that's, the, that's the most interesting part of this. Okay, in the interests of, of earning my enormous presenter's fee that the organisers haven't, haven't told me about yet, but I'm, I'm sure it's going to be fantastic, I should probably move on and, and talk through some of the stuff. Um, so the numbers, uh, unless I screwed it up, which is, which is more than possible, 80% um, of 1% uh, of, of 10,000 is 80, so that's our true positives. The remaining 20% is 20. Um, we get 990 false positives and 8,910 uh, 8, true negatives. Um, as we expect, the false positive rate comes out at 10%. That's kind of obvious, and, um, and the false negative rate of 20%. The thing that tends to shock people is that this means that only 7.5% of the things flagged by the detector are actually true positives. And so in a medical context, the thing that typically shocks people is this means if you have a test that uh, you know, has these rates that will, that will mark 80% of the people with the disease as positive and 1% of the and 10% uh, of the people without the disease as positive, you've actually got a 92.5% chance of not having the disease, disease even when you get a positive test result back. And what this emphasizes is you really need to be careful about where your cutoff rates are because it's very easy to get swamped with false positives if you are too aggressive about making sure you don't miss some positives, depending on how good your detector is, obviously. And clearly, the, you know, the solution for any of these things is better tests, but we can't always produce those. So, um, any questions, or shall we move on? I promise that's the end of the real maths. <laughs> real maths, the real <laughs> sums. So, in general, what happens, of course, is that as if we do have a, a sort of cutoff-based system, as, we, as, as I've already talked about, as we increase the cutoff, false positive rate goes down, but the false negative rate goes up, and the key is to try and find a good place. And it's not necessarily a point where the things cross over. It all depends on the relative cost of a false positive and a false negative. If it's incredibly important that you do detect almost all the positives, then obviously you have to accept a higher um, false positive rate in order to achieve that. The system still use, even, even the system we've talked about here that looks pretty horrible when you say only 7.5% of the things that came through actually were true positives, it's still the case that it's allowed you to look at only 1,070 of the 10,000 um, and detect 7.5% rate against a 1% background rate. So it's, you know, you're still getting significant benefit out of the system. Okay, so one-dimensional anomaly detection. Um, here is uh, an example of a uh, transaction stream um, which is the thing we tend to, tend to concentrate on. It's very simple, um, very typical. Typically with transaction streams, we have some kind of identifier, <coughs> some kind of several identifiers, a customer identifier, a transaction identifier, a bank account, any of these kinds of things. Doesn't really matter what it is, and I haven't been specific about what it is in this case. So we typically have one or more identifiers. Um, we typically have some kind of descriptive or categorization information, so you know, if it's a, supermarket and you're buying items, you know, what the kind of item is, what the shelf it came from, that kind of thing, what, what, what the size is, that kind of stuff. If it's a phone bill, you know, is it a long distance or a local call, is it international, is it a text message, is it data, whatever. Um, typically some kinds of numeric quantification, price being an obvious one, but, but can be any of these sorts of things. Potentially a bunch of other things, but they're typically um, fairly narrow tables. Um, and we're looking for the anomalous item. So in this case, we've got an ID field that's an integer. Um, and the constraints, so, so we're going to, the, one of the simple approaches to anomaly detection is to define constraints and to find things that fail the constraints as possible anomalies. 
So here we're interested in, so, so we're going to say the ID shouldn't be null. That's almost always the case. So in, in a pandas context, that's it shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a nan. Um, IDs, these are transaction IDs, so they ought to be unique in the table. If we get repetition, something's gone wrong. So we'd, we would want to detect that as an anomaly. Um, there are only five legal categories, A, A, C, B, Q, T, K, A, and T, B. Uh, and the price field should be non-negative and no more than £1,000 its price in sterling for these items. So, and this is obviously a very synthetic example, but a huge amount of anomaly detection will have fundamentally these sorts of properties. There might be other data types, you might be using dates as well. Dates would be a very common thing to have on here, actually. And again, you know, dates, <laughs> dates before 1970 are a complete no-go in the Unix world, of course. Um, dates of 1970 are almost always anomalous in the Unix world, um, and so forth. Um, so, do we have an exercise? Oh yes, and as I discovered yesterday, uh, it turns out that so there are feather. If you all succeed in downloading the stuff from GitHub, uh, there is an example of this data that you can actually work with um, in feather files. Um, if you is anyone here actually using Python 2 rather than Python 3 today? Okay. No, no, it's, it's not a shaming exercise. <laughs> so, if you are using Python 2, uh, what you should do is, if you've got the GitHub repo, you should rename the data fo folder data3, and you should rename data2 data, and then everything will work fine for you. The stuff in the data folder is Python 3 feather files, and it turns out that if you, you get some really good anomalies if you read those in Python 2. You get huge negative values and huge positive values for prices, even ones that I didn't, didn't put into the data. Um, okay, so now we have a more interesting set of exercises, um, and we have four different possible versions of the exercise. If you are um, relatively experienced with pandas and with doing this kind of stuff, then you can get the data with those two lines there um, from detect, assuming you've got detect on your path, make, make sure the detect file is somewhere on your Python path import get 2D outlier data frame. I suspect it should be 1D data outlier frame, but apparently I didn't know that when I wrote it. Um, and that will, that will get you the data. And your goal is just to detect all the things that fail, fail these constraints. If you are reasonably experienced with Python and have done a little bit with pandas but are not super confident about it, then instead start editing exercise1.py where there are templates for doing each of the five, four or five bits of this. And you can basically, there are little things saying fill in at various points where you can put in the actual detection functionality for the different kinds of data. Um, there is also a file called hints.txt that has helpful little hints uh, in order for the various exercises to, the, the various kinds of detection. See how to do them. There are some commented out uh, lines at the end of the thing calling the things in sequence. So if you uncomment the first one, it will fail to run because there's a fill in. You, you, you fill in the fill in bit and it should detect stuff for you. If you are really pretty new to Python and haven't done much of this stuff before, then start off by just running detect.py, which is a, a work solution that undoubtedly 100% correctly detects all the anomalies. Uh, in this data, <coughs> unless it doesn't. Um, read through the code and try to understand how it works and then point out the errors to me. And if you're even more expert than, than the experts who know how to do this stuff, look at detect.py and tell me all the things I've done wrong and all the things I've done inefficiently and all the things that you would have done much better and uh, will improve it for the data camp people. Um, I am going to give you a good, what time is it? a good sort of 10, 15 minutes to do this. I will wander around. <laughs> Attempting to help people, uh, not that I will probably succeed, but um, happy to take questions and so forth. Um, the solutions are on the slides as well, so if people have downloaded them and it's easier on the slides, there are copies on the slides. No, no. Stick a hand up. I need more water. No, no. I'll read it. 
Yes, yeah, I'm sorry, the text for people who haven't found it is in the 1D subdirectory, O-N-E-D, uh, of the GitHub repo. 
Okay, I think I'm tempted to carry on, but how, how are people... And I'm sure most of you won't have had time to do everything yet, but uh, obviously, you know, you've got the stuff so you can do it afterwards. People happy to carry on, or would you rather have another five minutes to get a bit further? I think I'm tempted to, tempted to carry on. The, the, main, the main... Obviously, for people who haven't done this stuff before, hopefully the sample code's useful and hopefully you're, you know, you're getting a feeling for what's involved in doing this. It's all conceptually simple stuff, but actually doing some of these things like finding duplicates, detecting values, creating new columns to represent those things is, is slightly painful in, uh, in code, in pandas. Um, so what we're going to do is look at some slightly easier ways of doing things, hopefully. Um, I'm not going to go through the sample code. Hopefully it's relatively self-explanatory. Um, so what we are going to do is looking at, uh, is, is look at making all this stuff simpler using the TDDA library. Um, now TDDA stands for Test Driven Data Analysis and um, the, the general uh, concept behind Test Driven Data Analysis is to borrow some of the ideas from Test Driven Development to try to make data analysis work more robustly. And some of that's to do with providing extensions to both unit test and PyTest to make it easier to write tests for analytical processes where maybe we can't just uh, write the correct answer beforehand because maybe the correct answer is a million numbers or, 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 or a graph or maybe it's different every time but has nice statistical properties or, or whatever. Um, so there's a lot of stuff for what we call reference testing in the library to do with writing these kinds of tests. But the other part of it is to do with checking data. And the idea is that it's for checking input data, output data, and uh, intermediate results that you, you produce to make sure that your code's doing what you thought on the data you developed the, the system with, and for checking new data as it comes in and that the results that you're producing are valid. But this turns out to be incredibly useful for anomaly detection as well, which is, which is why it's used in, in this context. So hopefully you've all succeeded in, uh, if, you're, if you're working along, um, PIP installing the TDDA library. Um, so this is what I have just said. So yes, the part of it we're going to be looking at is the functionality for uh, verifying data against constraints, which is pretty much what we're doing with the anomaly detection so far, um, automatically discovering constraints from good data, and actually running detection of bad data using the library. So going back to our example, um, the idea is that all of these constraints uh, are quite simple constraints that we could express in, for example, <coughs> JSON in a format like this. So um, this format, which the TDDA library understands, we just have a, a, a dictionary with fields in it, a key for each field, and then a set of constraints on each data. And there are uh, six or eight different kinds of constraints that the system understands. Um, it understands a type constraint, which is useful to put in anyway, so it knows what's going on with the field, um, though it doesn't have to be there. Um, we can specify the, uh, and, and then to, to represent the constraints we've got here, we first of all have a max nulls constraint that says the maximum number of nulls we're allowed in this field is zero. Usually that would either not be present at all, or we'd have this constraint. In some cases, um, it's not that uncommon for there to be systems in which you're allowed a single null in a column, but only a single one representing a kind of other value or something. So, so by having max nulls, uh, we can actually specify an, a number that's allowed, but typically we set that at zero or we don't put the constraint in. Um, no duplicates true means that we're not allowed repetition in the column, so our, the two constraints that we had, that it shouldn't be null and that it should be unique, um, are represented there. Um, the for String fields, again, in this case, we're saying it shouldn't be null and that there are only these five values that are allowed. We can also specify one or more regular expressions um, that, fields, that string fields ought to satisfy and the system will detect those as well. Uh, and for numeric fields and for date fields, we can put mins and maxes in. For strings, we can also put mins and maxes for the length of strings in. Uh, and so in this case, uh, we're saying that the minimum allowed value is zero, the maximum allowed value is a thousand and we're not allowed any nulls. So that file, constraints.tdda, uh, is present somewhere in probably in the 1D directory uh, that you've already got. 
And if you have installed everything successfully, then... Oh, we're doing the detect first. Okay, well, there, there are two different things. Well, actually, what this is going to show you is... Um, Oh, no, that's right, detect, that's, that's right, is, is, is using that file to find the records that violate the constraints in the data that we've got and to spit out that data. So when you install the TDDA library, it installs the TDDA command, and the TDDA command has three variants, TD, three main variants, TDA, TDDA discover, which is used to construct constraints files from data. We'll look at that in a minute. TDDA verify, which is used to check a set of data en masse against a set of constraints, and TDDA detect, which is used to uh, actually find the records that violate the constraints in the file and spit them out. So if you say TDDA detect and then give it the input file, which can either be a CSV file as long as it's in a suitable format that Pandas understands with the... Um, the slightly more sensible than default settings that we use, which are detailed, I think, on the next slide, um, and then give it the name of a suitable JSON file with those constraints in, so in this case, constraints.tdda, and then tell it where you'd like the bad records to go to, which, again, can be a feather file or a CSV file. That will cause the bad records to get spat out into bads.csv. Um, if you don't put any more flags on, it will just spit out the record number and uh, the number of constraints that failed for the records that fail. Uh, but you can, if you say per constraint, it will actually spit out a separate column for each constraint that has any failures, telling you which records failed which constraints. Uh, if you say minus minus output fields, it will include all the input fields as well as the output fields, so you can see the full record, or you can give it a list of fields that you do want spat out in the output. Uh, and you can also say, there's an option whose name I've forgotten to say, I want the good records spat out as well, and they'll get zeros for the number of failures if you actually want to kind of classify the whole file rather than just detecting the bads. So if you run that command and then look at bads.csv, you should find the very same set of records as detect produced and the very same set of records that you produced if you, in the very large amount of time I gave you, succeeded in constructing your own anomaly detectors to detect all that stuff. Uh, a few minutes ago. So, I will try that. He says. Uh, so here is the stuff. And if I say TDDA detect uh, my input data, which is data slash items dot feather and my constraints file, which is constraints.tdda and the output file that I want, which is bads.csv and I say minus output fields and I say minus something else. Oh, detect per, constra uh, per constraint. Hopefully that will tell me that six of my constraints passed, four of them failed. And hopefully that BADS file has a time very like now, 1423. And it has 33 lines in it, which are the ones that fail for some reason with trues and falses and all the stuff. So, so that's it. Is everyone succeeding with that? So this is this is this is quite nice. If you if you have a set of constraints you want to apply and they they, they fall into this sort of form, you can just write one of these JSON files by hand, and and this will act as a general purpose anomaly detection system in batch for you. Uh, but, of course, writing JSON files by hand is not an awful lot of fun. There's those damn trailing commas that don't work. There's all the quotes and stuff that are, that are very, very painful. painful. And anyway, we hate doing that sort of stuff. So um, the second part of it is, wouldn't it be nice if, rather than having to write the constraints by hand, you could actually get the system to construct the constraints for you? So I think we also have... We also have um, 
So, so the other idea with, with TDDA is that you can use the discover command to construct a TDDA file for you, a constraints file for you, that will characterize a set of presumed good data that you've given it. So if, if we run that on the whole data set, we typically won't get a very useful set of constraints because it, it, you know, it, it, it will classify all, all, all the bad records as good as well and therefore you know, we won't ban nulls and we'll allow crazy values and all the rest of it. But if we have some known good subset of data, then um, it will generate the constraints for us that we need. Even if we don't know which records are good, if we run it on the whole data set, we can then look at them and see whether the constraints look sensible and add the constraints that it should have put in that it doesn't have and you know, either tighten or change uh, the constraints that, uh, that we would have liked it to produce. And that's a lot less painful than constructing them by hand. So let's look at doing, and of course, everything we're doing, we can do through the API as well. So um, I've shown you how to run it from the command line, but there are simple Python calls to, to do all this stuff as well, of course. Um, so let's look at constructing one of those TDDA files from the good items. Um, so how do we do that? Oh yes, if you are using it with CSV files, these are, these are what the system uses by default. Um, you'll still have problems if you have empty strings and nulls, because that's very difficult to represent in a way that Panda's CSV reader can, can handle it. Uh, and there's the, yes, so there's the API version of what we've just done. As you can see, it's, it's almost exactly the same, just with Python calls rather than, um, rather than command line calls. Um, so let's now try and actually generate the constraints file automatically. And the way we do that is using this discover command. Um, so if we say tdda discover data slash good items dot further, good start tdda, that will run over the good items, which are exactly the all but the 33 that failed when we ran it just now. We can actually spit them out that way. Um, good start tdda then is the, is the location it will write the constraints file to, and we should get a file that's very similar to the one we started with. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about the second version of the command afterwards. So again, if people want to play along, that would be a good command to type. Or to cut and paste if you're lazy. Okay. And so, just give people a minute or two to, to actually do that. Mm -hmm. You map values. How does it distinguish? I assume it just looks at unique values in that column that you've got. Only one instance of that you could take over these days. Yeah. Does that distinguish between you know, being valid? So the, so, the, um, so, so, so the question was, how does it know what's a good value and what's a bad value? And the answer is it doesn't. It assumes that everything that you give it is valid. So it will, it, it will generate constraints in almost all, all cases that should be satisfied if you, if you run a, a verify or a detect on the data that you generate the constraints from, the whole file should pass in almost all circumstances. There is another version, in, so we have a commercial version of the software as well as, as part of our Miro product, uh, which we're not particularly holding back. This functionality just hasn't made it into the open source version yet. And in, in that commercial version, you can give it um, mixed good and bad data, and it will do some inference and try and work, I say inference, it will, it will use some heuristics to try and work out um, what's like to be good data and what's like to be bad data using complicated rules like if there's only one null, well, at least if there are only a couple of nulls in a, you know, out of 100,000, probably they're not supposed to be there and stuff like that. Um, you can give it hints about how much of the data is like to be bad and stuff like that. Um, but in this case, no, it, it, it's just very mechanically going through. So, you know, there's, there's nothing complex about it. The minimum that it puts in is the smallest value in the data. The maximum it puts in is the largest value in the data. It only says that there aren't any nulls if there aren't any nulls. The one exception being if there's a single null, it will say that the maximum number of nulls is, is one. If there are duplicates in the column, it won't generate a no duplicates constraint. It will generate every string that's in the thing, though it does, 
uh, if it bothers to produce a values constraint, if there are more than 20 or 30 or 100, I forget what the default is, then it, then it assumes it's a non-categorical field and doesn't bother producing the constraint. No. <coughs> Okay, so, so this is what I get when I run it. And obviously we get more constraints than we had before. We get this, exactly what I was talking about, this rather stupid constraint of, you know, the minimum allowed value is, how many zeros are there? There are 100,546,000, which is probably unlikely. Probably we would want to edit that and change it to 100 million, I would guess. And again, probably a maximum value of 999. Uh, 899 million is probably not sensible, so we'd probably either take that constraint off or possibly cap it if, it, if we think it's only supposed to have nine digits. Um, it, it distinguishes, it also puts in sign constraints. So obviously specifying the min and the max um, does determine the range of data that you're allowed. But the idea is that going from, if you had all positive values before and suddenly you get a negative, that's more significant than than just the range changing. And in particular, that if you do want to delete the min or the max constraint, that shouldn't necessarily remove the sign constraint. So we, we sort of redundantly code that. Um, you can see it's generated the allowed values, and it's generated more or less what we'd want for price, except it's obviously put in the maximum at 98518, which is the maximum good value that actually existed in the data. Um, we can make things slightly more interesting by doing the same generation, but adding minus, minus rec. Or is it minus rex? I think it's minus minus rex. And uh, what that does is gets it also for string fields to try to generate regular expressions. So one of the cleverer things, the, in fact, the only really clever thing in the library is it, um, it constructs regular expressions from examples. Now, if you give it, uh, you know, the works of Shakespeare or something, it's not, going to a good, it's not going to do a good job and it's going to take a very long time. But if you give it structured identifiers that are the sorts of things you might actually want to use regular expressions for, then it will typically do a fairly reasonable job. They're not always maximally tight or whatever, but it's, it copes in quite a lot of cases. Um, and so that's what I've done here. And <laughs> obviously our, our regular expression is going to be very simple, in fact. But... Um, what we should see is, as well as the explicit um, allowed values constraint, we get it's noticed that it's two letters in this case, and said A to Z2, which is a bit easier than doing it by hand. So that's, that's what you can do with the TDDA library. Um, now, obviously, what you might be thinking is, well, that's all very well, but uh, what if I want constraints that that aren't the half dozen kinds of things that you can express within the TDDA library, which is entirely valid. Um, what's still helpful is the framework of the TDDA library. So if you have extra constraints that you want, quite a powerful, there, 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 there are a few things that are very powerful to do in anomaly detection. One is just create new columns in your data that codify what you want. So if you, you know, if rather than having a min and a maximum, you have Two, two non-overlapping ranges or something. You create a new column that checks whether it's in that range that's maybe just a binary column. When you do a discover on it, hopefully, if you've done it on good data, all of those will come out as ones or zeros or trues or falses or whatever it is, so the constraint will get added. And you say, well, I did all the work. What's the value of that? The value of that is that then you have a whole load of columns like this as well as the ones it can generate for you that can then get checked and reported in the same way so that you get the, the correct indication of all the bad records. Um, including, uh, in, including the ones that fail the simple constraints and the more complicated ones. And so those can be things out of, you know, out of a neural network or out of a classifier or whatever. Um, the other thing that's very powerful to do is to not just look at the whole data set, but look at different subsets of the data set. So it may be that uh, you know, your red items have different characteristics from the blue items, and, and that if you build separate constraints files for those, you'll get much tighter constraints that are much more useful. Um, and it's also very useful often to uh, use the thing on derived data sets as well as the main data sets. So, for example, to aggregate, you know, to count the number of things by various items and then check that you, you have all the values that you expect, that you have the right ranges for those kinds of things. So it's not just a question of simplicity throwing it at, at the primary data set. It's very much a question of using it for all the different bits and pieces. And going slightly beyond anomaly detection in a, in a more general data analysis context, it's incredibly useful to check your input data with this, to, character, you know, to check that the data you're getting matches the sorts of constraints that you had on the data that you developed the system with, to check intermediate files, and most importantly, to check output files, because um, you know, we all talk about garbage in, garbage out. The one thing that's worse than garbage in, garbage out is 
is gold in garbage out, right? You really don't want to be producing analysis systems that take perfectly good data and produce nonsense from them. And yet that's what um, I'm sure none of your systems do, but occasionally systems I have known and possibly have, have been involved with producing can do. Does the library have any helper functions to, because it's a generate constraints from a data set you don't know if it's, it has notes, for example? Yeah. You don't want notes, do you have a function that creates a summary of how many notes, how many duplicates? Uh, no, not in the library. Obviously, if you run the discover process over it, you can, you can sort of start to infer that. Um, yeah. Again, our, you know, our software does that, and the, those sorts of profiling things are very common, but no, there's nothing in the library itself to do that. Um, good suggestion. Contributions always accepted. <laughs> um, not always accepted. Sometimes accepted when they're really high quality, non-anomalous contributions. Um, but again, I'm, I'm sort of hoping that most people have ways of summarizing data already, and we're, we're trying to add value in the places where, where it's more difficult. Um, okay, let's carry on. Any questions before we move on? Or problems? Or... Good. I'll take that as a good sign. Uh, we've seen that. We have... That. That's the API version of generating the same stuff. <laughs> generalized seasonality. Yes, I come from Edinburgh, where we have generalized seasons. Um, <clears throat> I kid you not, actually. I, um, we, we started, you probably know, until recently, PyData London was the only uh, PyData meetup in, in Britain, and Edinburgh became just about the second. I think we just beat Bristol, at least in terms of uh, actually getting the first meeting to happen, which was great. We had about 100 people at the first one. Uh, in fact, we had more people turn up than, than had signed up for the event, which was pretty amazing. Um, second one got snowed off, being Edinburgh, because the building we were supposed to be showing it in, uh, holding it in, was, was closed. But, uh, but if you are up in Edinburgh, do come to PyData Edinburgh. We'd love to see you. Um, so with... An awful, lot of the data, an awful lot of the data we see, particularly in streams, is going to have some kind of a date stamp on it. And um, dates are every data scientist's favorite kind of data because there's so much infinite variety in, in, in formats, in patterns, in, uh, in ways of counting things. Um, and obviously, we're all familiar with the idea that there are uh, regularities in, in the patterns of data very often. So, uh, you know, there may be... Uh, different characteristic volumes at different, uh, in, in different, different months of the year, different seasons. Um, there can be different patterns on different days of the week characteristically, different times of day. Special dates like public holidays can see quite different patterns and so forth. So there are lots of things that we might need to adjust. And if we want to detect um, you know, even just unusual transaction volumes, for example, that might indicate uh, something going wrong with a server or some kind of a DDoS attack or some kind of a gaming attack or something. We kind of have to know what the background is in order to be, and, and adjust for that in order to be able to do this sensibly. Otherwise, we can only detect the most extreme situations. So adjusting for known patterns uh, in, is, is, is very obviously an important thing in the context of seasons uh, and, in fact, can be quite an important thing more generally. Um, Relatedly, uh, if you're lucky enough to be in uh, a company that's growing, or indeed unlucky enough to be in a company that's shrinking, it may be that the, there's a characteristic downward trend that you need to adjust for, or upward trend that you need to adjust for. Uh, and so very often we have to apply um, corrections like this. Um, so here is a fairly typical, um, you probably can't read it, but th that's the 24 hours of a day showing the volume of transactions for something or other. I think it's web visits or something during a day. Um, and on the right, there's that very much the same thing, but over seven days where we see there are different characteristic volumes for different days of the week as well. And if we want to try and detect problems with that, if we don't adjust for even, even that level, even where it's just like a factor of three or four or five or six or something, well, five or six or something from the peak to the trough. We're not, we're not going to do a good job if we don't adjust for that. Um, so we need to normalize. Um, and so if we look at, you know, a typical pattern, so the idea is that the, the orange that you can't see at all Orange line on that. 
um, is the, uh, the sort of expected normalized behavior, and the blue is the actual. And a couple of points stand out very clearly. Um, you know, that peak definitely doesn't, doesn't look right and should get picked up by almost all, any anomaly detector. Um, and similarly, slightly less obviously, but, but still pretty obviously, that, that trough at zero looks very bad indeed uh, if nothing's fallen over. Um, if we want to... So, so you might hope at this point that um, statistics would come to our rescue and tell us where the outliers are, but unfortunately statistics doesn't really help because, sure, we can calculate standard deviations and things like that, and those will, those will give us some numbers to look for, but typically our data not only isn't normal and the central limit theorem doesn't, doesn't really end up helping that much, um, typically it all becomes a, a question of judgment. We have to decide again on the false positive rate we want, the false negative rate we want, how sensitive we want the systems to be. So we typically end up having to put um, bands around our expected values. Um, and we typically have to make two different kinds of bands. So one is we have to look at some kind of a proportionate thing because obviously we're interested in how far multiplicatively from, from the value we expect is things. But we also, particularly for the low values, need to have some kind of an absolute thing so that you know, if we've got a very low expected volume, we're not going to take one missing transaction as, as indicating that there's a problem when there's not. So we typically need to combine um, both things, a proportionate one and an absolute deviation from expectation. And when we do that, we inevitably get boundary cases. So here we've identified, you know, the ones that are very obviously wrong, but what about the ones I've identified in orange? They're a little bit, <laughs> they're a little bit away from the orange lines that you can't see, honestly. Um, but are they far enough away? Who knows? So, um, you know, a typical example for something like this with the sorts of numbers we had on the previous slide might be that we're going to classify something as an outlier if the actual value is larger than expected by at least 50%, or by at least 150, so this is you know, in an hour or whatever, um, or if it's lower than expected by at least a third and by at least 150. Um, and I mean, I'm going to say there are no general rules for, rules for choosing limits, there are, or, or, or a different way of saying the same thing would be there are as many rules for choosing limits as you want, but at the end of the day, it always comes down to, comes down to judgment. Um, so, so, so we end up looking at historical problems and setting limits and looking at how fast it goes off and when it's going off too much we turn it down a bit and when it's not going off enough we, we turn it up a bit and then, then we stop there typically. So what we end up if we do that um, is effectively saying here's our actual pattern and we've got some upper limit we're willing to accept and we've got some lower limit and they all, they all kind of look the same but they're scaled. Um, and that was clever. There's the solution to the exercise of how you calculate those. I guess those are, those are simple enough. We probably would have wanted to do that. I think there's an exercise coming somewhere. Turns out that detects all sorts of things that you would undoubtedly say looking at them. Yeah, but I mean, it's so marginal. That 150 was so arbitrary. We don't really want to detect that. But the trouble is that's not to do with the magic number 150 because if we picked 155, it would just have been a different marginal set. There are always marginal cases. It does emphasize that a useful thing to do is not only to have a binary detector, but to have something that tells you, you know, how much does this breach the limits by, so you can at least prioritize things for the ones that are miles above, the ones that are miles below. Um, but but you, you're still always going to end up with the detectors going off when you don't want them to, and also missing cases that actually, um, you know, there are no, there are no perfect solutions. Um, yes? I don't know whether you missed it. Maybe, maybe I slightly forgot to say it. Um, where we get the expected value from is by looking at history. So typically, if we're, uh, you know, so in this case, literally all we're doing is if we're looking at, um, you know, we just look back over three months or six months or a year or whatever period we need to establish the norm and literally just calculate on an hour by hour basis, first of all, uh, over a day, what's the typical pattern for the day. And then if we're interested in weekly trends, we also calculate it on a, on a, on a uh, per week trend, and then we either, uh, depending on whether we think the two effects are, are multiplicative or not, we either separately compute for each day uh, what is the average over, say, the last six months for Saturdays each hour of the day, or if we think that the patterns are pretty much the same but scale day by day, we can potentially get a slightly more useful value by computing a, you know, a, a daily pattern and just scaling it by the, the, uh, uh, the day of the week pattern separately. 
Sorry, you're quite right. I should have said that. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, so that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened here. So, so, um, so if we calculate the obvious limit just by multiplying by one and a half and um, adding 150 and taking the higher of those to get the maximum and taking the lower of the other two to get the minimum uh, and capping it at zero, this is what this is what gets detected. I'm hoping there's an exercise coming up soon. There is. Um, so that's the, that's the sort of graphical approach. But what, again, is quite interesting is to go through and actually try um, writing a detector that calculates that. It's not particularly hard, but it's quite interesting. So if you, I think there's just one version of the exercise this time. If you start from exercise 2.pi, which is probably in the directory with a long, helpful name like add norm our day, I would guess. Um, there's some, there's some starter code there that you should be able to uh, either yourself write the upper and lower definitions or, or just take them out of the earlier slides. Um, and then, oh, no, this is, this is for plotting the graph, actually. Yes, so the idea is given starter code that, that plots the actual versus expected, versus expected graph, can we, can we plot this graph in matplotlib? Um, which should, yeah, which should produce this this graph here. Uh, and again, there are hints in hints two dot text in that directory. And then the third exercise that you can move straight on to, if you get to that, is doing it algorithmically. I actually pulling out the outliers rather than just plotting the graph. So again, we're getting towards the end, which is good. So that's, that's really what I'm going to leave you with. Um, if you want to work through it now, by all means do. I'll stick around a while. If you want to look at it afterwards, that's fine. Or if you just got the general idea and can't really be bothered with coding it, that's fine too. We have libraries to help you. Um, so I will stick around and help anyone who's stuck. Uh, but that's really what I wanted to cover today. I hope that's been useful. I would be very interested in feedback. Obviously, as I say, this was set up initially for an online course, which is why you can see some of the exercises are very much about just coding stuff. But I hope the concept's useful, and I hope you'll find the library useful, um, and, and that it gives you some feel generally for how normal detection can work.